Mostly through here now. Stairs in here. Okay. okay. <clears throat> On Monday, um, the you guys will meet with the freshman class to hear Dr. Axe speak at nine o'clock that morning. Um, he is uh, he's going to be talking about. <clears throat> Uh, a model system, which um, I think you'll find interesting. He's um, Dr. Axe is uh, unlike anyone that you guys have been exposed to in your lifetime. He uh, has uh, degrees from uh, University of California, Berkeley. Um, Caltech, he did fellowship and uh, uh, research funded uh, work at Cambridge for several years. He uh, currently um, administrates a research facility in Seattle, Washington, and um, he has published um, in the last seven or eight years, he's published what is um, definitively um, what should be um, the death nail in the naturalism model for our current understanding of science. So I, I didn't, I, I can't overstate the importance of the research that he's done. Um, and of course, this stuff has been published in um, very prominent research journals. Uh, because of his interpretation of the research that he did on um, protein modeling, he lost his job at Cambridge. Um, but there are a lot of people in this world who um, have funds necessary to make sure that kind of research continues. And um, he has, he went through a phase, and maybe he'll talk a little bit about this with you, but I've been following him um, for some time. He went through a phase in his career where I think he became a bit disillusioned in the last five years or so with the scientific community. Um, and he talks a little bit about that in his uh, newest book. Um, so much so that his latest writings appear to be a shift in his focus. Uh, I don't think that he is in any way given up on the scientific enterprise, um, but uh, I think in his view at this point, he would say that we have to educate the general population because um, the general population um, will ultimately be those that will apply the pressure necessary for the scientific community um, to begin to tell the whole story to the general public. So um, I, I wanted to give you just a little introduction this morning about that. Um, it's very expensive to have people like this um, give talks. And it is, you are young people, you've been in your protected Louisiana College bubble, and you don't know what is really going on out there. Um, you can't possibly. But you will. You'll leave us. You guys will go off to graduate professional schools here in a couple of years. And it won't take long before um, it will be clear to you just what, um, just what kind of dogma exists in the world today, where people will tell you what you are to think, they will tell you um, how you are to interpret data, and you will not be allowed to question their interpretation of the scientific data available. Um, so I'm very sensitive to that matter, and I am, uh, I am 
excited and somewhat apprehensive about Dr. Axe being here because in some sense um, I'm excited for the opportunity for myself and for the students of Louisiana College, but a bit apprehensive because I fear that as a group of young people, the Louisiana College Science student community may not really understand what opportunity they have before them. So that sounds very serious, and it is. And so um, I have I scanned the first chapter of uh, this book. This just came out in August. I think it represents what he's doing now, which is to shift his focus. The book is not written for science people. It's written for the general population. And so um, my expectation is that you will read, it's only 11 pages, and the, the, the font is big. Um, I read the whole book in an afternoon. And uh, just because I'm familiar with a lot of it, so a lot of it I went through quickly. But um, he will have these available, I'm sure we'll have some available to sell at cost while he's here uh, on Monday night. And you may, you may be interested, maybe not. But um, even if you're not, I think, that, I think that most of you will come to a point in your life when you're doing your graduate professional work well, you'll, you'll start to say to yourself, now, wait a minute. And I hope that in those moments that you will be savvy and wise enough to pursue reading um, things outside of the scientific mainstream um, so that you can be, I think, objectively educated. So, um, anyway. So, your expectation. Monday at 9, the class will meet in the large lecture room. You'll be in there with the freshmen. Dr. Boyce is having the freshman kids also read the chapter. Um, but they're further behind in life than you are. And so um, Dr. Axe will give his presentation. And um, I hope that you guys will be able to get something out of that after having been introduced to his writing. All right, any questions about that? You guys, nine o'clock and two thirty-four on Monday. All right. So we had talked about the shoulder and the rotator cuff muscles. I wanted to just uh, pop this up there just to get started again this morning. A uh, reminder of the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and remember those attachments on the greater uh, tubercle. The uh, the nerves that control them. We talked about and looked at those on the brachial plexus. The subscapularis was the last one. And uh, I think we finished class, I was showing you the tendons here on the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle. And I think I pointed out to you just very briefly here uh, the tendon of the long head. I think we were talking about the bursa, right? The bursa and the shoulder. And I said that's a good thing to have a bursa sac uh, wrapped around the tendon of the long head in order to protect the intervertebral groove. So the subscapularis attaches here it is the only anterior support, and of course uh, that makes that the most vulnerable anterior and inferior, the most vulnerable place for the articulation between the head of the humerus and the groin cavity. That's where it comes out. Okay, and so the subscapular nerve, I think we pointed that out um, right at the end. Remember, we talked about. The dorsal scapular, we had talked about um, uh, the innervation of the back muscles as we worked our way down through the brachial plexus nerves. And we said at the end there for the subscapular that um, this guy is, um, the subscapular is coming off of the posterior cord. And so we worked our way down from the roots and then off of the uh, upper trunk, and then we work, work this one off of the posterior cord. So we're just sort of working our way down. This is all stuff we did before. Now, let me add to this here at this point, um, because in this picture, when you look at this, I mentioned this very briefly, but I wanted to, at the beginning of class today, sort of tidy this up. We saw supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor here on the posterior aspect of the scapula. That muscle right there is the teres major. And we do not consider it to be a supporting, the tendon of the major is not considered to be a support 
for the rotator cuff. It, it's not considered part of the rotator cuff. It's not considered to be a support for um, the shoulder joint. And the question the student should have is, why not? And so the answer to the question is because it attaches to the humerus further down. So the teres minor comes across here, and you can see its attachment here actually wraps the head of the humerus. You see that? This posterior um, kind of phenomenon here. It wraps around the head and sits on the greater tubercle there. This muscle, the teres major, comes also from the lateral border of the scapula, but its attachment is near the intertubercular groove. So it's further down. And what's more, if I said intertubercular groove, you should know immediately that I have moved this to the front of the bone. So we're going to see several things there near where the major attaches. Um, we're going to see the pectoralis major there. We're going to see the latissimus dorsi there. But this is the first one here, and I wanted to make an emphasis to you here because even in your cat dissection, you can see this. If you look at where these muscles attach, you can see the, the minor attaching posterior here, wrapping the head. And the major then tucks under and attaches on the front side of the humerus. And of course, it also gets um, the subscapular innervation just like the subscapularis does. And that's another good way to remember that. Um, so in this picture, we said that it gets subscapular nerve innervation for the subscapular. And here I have the teres major also gets subscapular innervation. And so why would that make sense? Why would the subscapular nerves go to the major and the subscapularis? Because they are both on the anterior side of the humerus. That makes good sense that those nerves uh, provide information to both of those muscles, the major and the subscapularis. Okay, so here it is, the major attaches to the inferior angle, lateral scapular, and over to the inner tubercular groove, and it gets subscapular innervation. Okay, now, <clears throat> before we continue this, we'll just keep doing this over and over again. Let's see if you guys can help me out in naming some things here. So I'll point and you name. Ready? The levator scapula. What's that? The clavotrapezius. That is the splenius. These are the rhomboids. What cervical bone is this? Seven. Which one is this? So this is the minor, C7, T1. What is this? It says, please wait. We'll wait for just a moment. <coughs> okay, good. So this is minor and major. So what is that? T5. T5. Good. What is this muscle? So I started the class today with this one. <laughs> that is the supraspinatus, and this is the infraspinatus. What's that? That's the chromium. What is this muscle? The teres minor. That's the teres minor, and this is the major label. Okay. Now, let's work our way. We haven't done these yet, so I'm going to do them multiple times. This muscle right here. These, there are two of the three heads that are shown here are on the posterior side of the humerus. See the humerus right there? So this one right here comes up and attaches to the scapula. See that? That is the long head of the tricep. It's going to attach to the infraglenoid tubercle. 
that one is the lateral pit of the tricep. And so in the lab, you found these two, same attachments. And then um, if you look between these, further down on the humerus, you look apart a little bit there, you can see the medial pit, the third pit. And they all attach to the electron and the ulna. What's the name of this muscle? That's the deltoid. Okay. So the other one here that's interesting attached to the scapula, um, and then I'll we'll go to brachial plexus again and review that again, is this one, the serratus anterior. And you guys found this already? Pat? Yeah? You located it near the scalenes? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. The serratus anterior, interesting attachment here on the scapula. It is attached to the ribs. So the first eight ribs is attached. And remember, these numbers are starting to get crazy. Uh, do your best to try to remember all the numbers. Do, you know, hammer away at that as best you can. Um, but remember that the numbers, the specific numbers, are really not my intent. I could, I could do them to myself or anybody. I would challenge Dr. Whitworth to this. Just make a 50 question test just asking what's attached to C7 or T1 or, or the first rib or the eighth rib. That gets crazy to try to remember that. So that's not my intent. You have to learn some of those details. Try to remember them. It will not cost you a grade level to uh, forget specific numbers. And I've been pointing out to the ones that really important to me. Like C7, you know that one's coming. All right. So the lateral aspect of the first eight ribs to the vertebral border of the anterior surface of the scapula. Now, is that what that looks like? Where is the vertebral border on the scapula? It's on the other side. Okay, so if you were um, if you were dissecting one of these things, what muscle would you cross if you walked along the tendon of the serratus anterior? Y'all see that? You cross over the inferior aspect of the subscapularis to attach on this side of the scapula. Okay, now this one gets long thoracic innervation. Uh, from C5 to C7, let's have a look. What do you mean long thoracic? Okay, so again, let's describe where, what these things are coming off of. We just looked at the subscapular coming off the posterior cord, and now the long thoracic here for the serratus anterior, how would you describe it? Innervated by C5, C7. Okay, so, so is it really part of what we think of the brachial plexus proper? It's not, is it? What other nerve, what other nerve did we talk about that, that has the same kind of phenomenon? Remember? 3, 4, 3, 5, uh, sorry, 3, 4, 3, 5, 3, 5. Yes, we're working our way down on that, those three muscle groups before. So this one, the dorsal scapular comes off of these roots, comes off the ventral ring line. And this long thoracic is that way too. So you can remember the long thoracic is 5 to 7. So long thoracic. Five, six, and seven um, interface the serratus anterior. Okay, so we're picking up, we're getting most of these taken care of now, yes? We've done the subscapulars, the long thoracics, uh, we've talked about the cords and the dorsal scapulars. We pick these up as we're going down through the brachial plexus, we're picking all these up. All right, now the tricep, as I mentioned just a moment ago, on the back of the arm, has three heads. A long head, a lateral head, and a medial head. And as we just pointed out, the long head goes all the way up to the infradermal tubercle. The long head, sorry, the lateral head attaches to the shaft of the humerus uh, more superiorly than the medial head, and they all attach to the electron. Now, let's go back to the brachial plexus again, because the tricep receives innervation from the radial nerve. Okay, so when we talked about this before, we're, we're in the brachial plexus proper now. We talked about um, the, the arrangement of the major nerves of the brachial plexus. So where would you find them? So uh, the first one we pointed out is the musculocutaneous, and that one picks up the bicep. It's the major flexor nerve on the front of the arm. And the bicep, remember, has its attachments on the radial tuberosity, the coracoid process and the rim of the glenoid cavity. Are y'all learning these with me? The bicep 
with the muscular cutaneous and bicep. We're also going to see it again today. I'm going to do it again with you because I want to show you the coracobrachialis and I want to show you the brachialis, deep muscles here that do flexion, the shoulder and the elbow. Okay, so that's muscular cutaneous. If I were doing the dissection, if I were doing the dissection on brachial plexus, as I opened up um, the lateral aspect here of, of the arm and pull the scapula back, and I began to tease away, and I start seeing all this mass of nerves in there that I'm going to have to wonder about, try to figure out what they are. The first thing I would do is to clear a path to the bicep because you can see the nerve that goes into that muscle. I always use the muscular cutaneous as my orientation nerve. From there, I can go everywhere else. You can track it that way, you can track it that way, and you can run into the other things that you have to identify. So the muscular cutaneous you see here is the bicep thing, and then it runs out here and picks up lateral forearm sensation. Um, the next nerve here is very interesting, which comes forward. It comes anterior across the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. It actually proceeds from the posterior aspect of the arm. Is the radial nerve. That's the one we're interested in right now. So it picks up the tricep, the radial nerve does. And then as it approaches the cubital fossa, it comes over the medial epicondyle anteriorly. And then this is going to be important. Not only does it do tricep for elbow extension, but it also does the flexor, sorry, it also does the extensors for wrist extension. So it does extension at the elbow and it does extension at the wrist. The odd thing is the way the nerve traverses through the cubital fossa, it actually comes across this lateral epicondyle here, anteriorly. It's really interesting when you're doing an experiments. So we have stimulators in the lab now, and you can do this. You can put, you can put a stimulator uh, at different places on your elbow and get different phenomena. The experiment that the lab exercise does is experiment in flexor contraction in the arm. So it wants you to find the median nerve. So the median nerve here is the big one, and it's the one responsible for all the flexion in the forearm. Most, not all, most of the flexion uh, in the arm is done by the median nerve. There's two flexors that get ulnar and the brachioradialis um, is different. But most of them do medium does flexion. Okay, so you want to find it. So you take your little stimulator and you put it on your elbow here. You put it on your cubital fossa here. And you turn it on. And instead of your wrist doing this, it does this. What's wrong with the placement of your stimulator? It's on the radial nerve. Yeah, so this is a phenomenon. Students, I've seen this before in the lab. Put a little stimulator on there and they say, my, my, my wrist is not coming forward, it's going backwards. That's because they didn't have a good anatomy teacher. They would know why that is. Because of the traversing of the radial nerve over the anterior aspect here. The radial nerve, you can see, is responsible. It's going back behind the radius here. It's going to pick up the extensors. And so the other nerve here then in the cubital fossa is the median nerve. And then remember we talked about the funny bone. And there's nothing funny about that. It sits behind the medial epicondyle. So you bang that, bang your elbow on something, and you get tingling in your little finger. That's an ulnar nerve phenomenon. Okay, so where are the major nerves? You got it now, right? Radial posterior tricep, posterior extensors, muscular cutaneous, bicep, yeah, lateral forearm sensation, median nerve, flexors, ulnar nerve, behind the medial epicondyle, flexors, on the pinky finger side, on the medial side. Okay, good. So here it is. The major nerves of the brachial plexus, muscular cutaneous, median ulnar radial axillary. So the one we're talking about right now is radial nerve. And you can see that it picks up the triceps, the extensors, it does supination, it does the posterior lateral entire limb. Big, huge, major nerve, your first introduction today 
by way of the tricep. Notice it comes from the posterior cord. And I can post track the posterior cord to all three posterior divisions, right? I've done this before. And back um, to upper, middle, and lower trunks, and all the way back to all divisions of the roots. Okay. Now, <clears throat> before we leave the arm here, we're just working our way down. I'd really like to get to the carpal tunnel today. The brachialis here attaches to the coracoid process and over to the brachium. Now, let's keep track of these. Some of these are really important, and I've mentioned this before, so let's do it again. The coracoid process of the scapula is an important attachment, right? Right? Tell me why. Why is the coracoid process? What important things have we already seen here? This is a really important spot on the scapula. I'll get you started. <clears throat> There's a ligament that goes from the coracoid process to the head of the humerus called the coracohumeral ligament. It is a key ligament in holding the head of the humerus in the glenoid cavity. It's the only one that I ask you to know um, of the four that are listed on that slide. Now I mentioned the glenohumeral ligaments, there are three of those, but the coracohumeral is the only major ligament from the scapula that hangs on, right? What else is there on the coracoid process? Yeah, so there's a bursa. There's a couple of them under here that protect the tendon of the subscapularis under the coracoid process. Good. Keep the list coming. <clears throat> if I look at the shoulder joint, I would notice, I would notice in the shoulder that there's a tendon that passes through the intertubercular groove. It is covered, that tendon is covered by a tendon sheath to protect it, to protect the bone from its rubbing. There is a ligament that crosses it, that staples it in there, called the transverse humeral retinaculum. And that tendon attaches to the rim of the glenoid cavity. What muscle is that? Thank you. That is the tendon of the long head of the bicep. Okay, now, the bicep has two heads. Both of them attach to the radial tuberosity. The bicep itself gets innervation from what nerve? The muscular. Good, the muscular cutaneous, all right? And then the short head of the bicep goes here to the coracoid process. So the long head and the short head here, short head on the coracoid, long head on the rim of the glenoid cavity to the radial tuberosity. Now, we are going to see, as we work our way around to the chest here, we're going to see that the pectoralis minor attaches to the third, fourth, and fifth rib and attaches here to the coracoid process. And here, as we work our way in that direction, we have the coracobrachialis attaching to the coracoid process and the body of the humerus. All right, so does it surprise you that the coracobrachialis gets musculocutaneous? No, because it's also getting the bicep, which is also attached to the coracoid process. This is the same logic I used a minute ago whenever I talked about the attachments of, attachment of the teres major. All right, so the coracobrachialis there um, to the body of the humerus. All right, now we're going to work our way down. Um, from the humerus, since I'm up here near um, the proximal of the humerus, I'm going to go ahead and do the latissimus dorsi here. This one gets C6 to C8 innervation by way of the thoracodorsal nerve. All right. Now this is good because this is a, a repeat of something we've already said. The thoracodorsal nerve comes off of, huh? Right. The thorac I hear some mumbling. But you can see that the thoracodorsal nerve comes off of the posterior cord just like the upper and lower subscapulars do. Okay, so this is the muscle that innervates the latissimus dorsi. It has an indirect attachment to the spinous processes of T7 to L5. Okay, T7. Right, so let's do another big one here. What other major muscle of the back attaches to Seven. The trapezius. Huh? The trapezius. The trapezius does, yeah. 
So there will be a shared attachment on the spinous processes here of the trapezius and the latissimus dorsi. Why does it say indirect attachment? Huh? No, that's a good guess though. That one ends at C6. This is the way the textbook lists it. And I always, when I read stuff like that, I go, now why would they list it like that? Okay, and I, I look at your cat when you look at this to try to bring this point home, but because the tendon sheath of latissimus dorsi, the aponeurosis of latissimus dorsi, the huge sheath, is so expansive, it tends to fuse with the muscle fibers of other muscles as it gets to these bony pieces. And so the text, the authors, uh, like to say indirect whenever it's mingling with the fibers of another muscle. It's almost like they're saying in these areas that from T7 down to T12, it's mingling with the attachments of the trapezius. And down to L5, it's part of this uh, lumbar fascia. That's what they're called, the thoracodorsal or the, the yeah, the thoracodorsal fascia or the lumbar fascia. You look on the back, y'all seen this on the cat? It's not muscle there, it's just all sheet stuff. Okay. So that's just a to you know just to make a point of it, just to help you remember. And then uh, it's also attached to the ribs, 10, 11, and 12, and the iliac crest. So the crest of the ilium here has a latissimus dorsi attachment. So this muscle of the back goes from your hip to your arm. The latissimus dorsi goes from the coxa bone all the way to the arm. It attaches to the floor of the intertubercular group. Have you seen anything else there at the intertubercular group today? I saw a tendon passing through it. That would be the long head of the bicep. And then I made a big deal about a muscle that should have been a rotator cuff muscle, but, but it's not because it attaches anteriorly. So this back muscle attaches to the front of your arm, the latissimus dorsi. Okay, now flip it around to the front here. This is the pectoralis major, and I put this one here this way on purpose because it also has an intertubercular groove attachment. This one attaches to the clavicle, the sternum, the cartilage of the first six ribs, and the aponeurosis of the external oblique, which we haven't talked about yet. And it goes to the intertubercular groove. Now, what would be the names of the nerves that you would think would go to the pectoralis major and minor? If the subscapularis gets innervation from the subscapular nerves, then wouldn't it make good sense to name the nerves that go here to the pectoralis major, the pectoral nerves? And that's exactly what happens. The minor goes from ribs three to five to the coracoid process. What is that? The long one of the tricep. That is the short head of the bicep. That is the short head of the bicep. That's right. That's the short head of the bicep. What is that? That's the long head. Why is that doubled up right there? That's a person sack around that tendon, right? 